Okay, part six. The last one just kind of cut me off there. I guess I got tired of them. Anyway, let's, um, let's start off on page 11, 17. I'm going to kind of pick it up a little bit and, and kind of move through this, hitting on the highlights. Uh, let's start pressure intermodal tanks. Uh, key thing I mentioned earlier, pressure intermodal tanks would be a spec 51. You need to know that. Type of container is designed, it carries anywhere from the 100 to 500 PSI. Uh, 1118, a ton container. A ton container, and there's an example on figure 24115, that is a ton container. These are pressurized tanks that have the capacity of one short ton or approximately 2,000 pounds. They're typically stored on their sides and the ends or the heads of the containers are a convex or a concave type shape. Uh, that's where they are unloaded or offloaded would be on the sides in front of the tanks. They are pressure containers. Y cylinders and Y ton containers are the type of compressed gas cylinders that can be bulk or non-bulk and they're typically classified as bulk. Y cylinders or Y ton containers have two specifications. Uh, that could be the DOT 3AA, which is a seamless steel cylinder with a water capacity of not over a thousand pounds, or a DOT 3AAX, which is a seamless steel cylinder with a water capacity of not less than a thousand pounds. Cylinders. A cylinder is a non-bulk pressure vessel designed for pressures higher than 40 psi and has a circular cross section but does not include any of the other containers, tanks, or vessels described in the previous sections. All approved cylinders with the exception of some that are stored Poisons are equipped with safety relief devices. Cryogenic containers. Cryogenic containers, page 1120. Cryogenic containers are designed to store and transport cryogens. A cryogen, know this, this is something you do need to know, a cryogen, also called refrigerated liquid gas, make sure you know that, is a gas that turns into a liquid at or below 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Make sure you know that. Cryogenic container examples are provided as contents. You need to know that the contents such as liquid oxygen, nitrogen, helium, hydrogen, argon, and liquid natural gas. Those are some of the uh, uh, products that might be carried. You need to know those products. So make sure you highlight the contents. And that's on page 1121. Let's go to page 1124. And let's go to, let me get there on my page here. Cryogenic tank trucks. I'm just about there. A lot of this stuff is repeat from the other containers, so I'm not going to just keep reading the stuff that's repeated. You can read through that. All right, cryogenic tank trucks. Must know this, cryogenic, you must know this is an MC338. We already said that pressurizer 330, MC331s, this is an MC338. So if we're doing a skill, and I hold up a container, you have to be able to identify that container by its shape and you will say that is a cryogenic tank truck that is MC338. You'd have to tell me the pressures and you're also going to have to tell me if there's an emergency shutoff on those. So add this, cryogenic tank trucks, add this, double shell with insulation, write that next to it, double shell with insulation. These trucks have well insulated aluminum or steel tanks 
with the vacuum sealed shells, double shell with insulation. MC338 have the following features. You must know this. Relief valves. Now, we said that a pressurized tank, both ends are rounded, both ends are rounded. For a cryogenic tank, one end is rounded, the other end is flat. There's a compartment in the back, and it's flat. It's got doors on it, and that's where you unload and offload of those doors. So a rounded end with a flat in the back with the container. That's where you would know that is a cryogenic tank. You need to know emergency shutoffs are on the left front, right rear, and that it's carrying uh, products at a minus 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Let's go to page 1126. Uh, we do need to know what a door is. A door, flask, is a non-bulk, non-pressurized insulated container that has a vacuum space in between the outer shell, and the inner vessel. What we really need to know is that the volume of the door flap is often between 4 gallons and 125 gallons. So just understand that it is a non-bulk, non-pressurized insulated container that carries between a 4 and 125 gallons. Liquid holding containers. Common liquid containers include bottles, gasoline containers, paint pails, drums. Many liquid containers have some pressure due to the uh, liquid's chemical and physical properties. So let's go 1127. Let's look at the regardless size transportation. Let, we have to know the indications of liquid containers, and that might include the following. So let's look at those indications. So make sure flat or less rounded ends, access hatches, low pressure rail tank may have multiple fittings visible on top. Multiple fittings visible on top. You would know if I can see the fittings, it is low pressure. So flat ends on the tanks and multiple visible fittings for non-pressure. I am going to skip all the way to some of your low pressure storage tanks. And I'm on 1129. Okay, let's look up here on 1129. For the most part, for your low pressure storage tanks, you're going to have to be able to look at those tanks. I'll give you an example. If you were to see a picture, and I'm on page table 2412, low pressure storage tank. If you were given that picture as a flashcard, you would need to know by looking at it, that is a dome roof tank by looking at it. You'd need to know if you saw a spheroid tank. That is a spheroid tank, a noted spheroid tank. You need to know that by looking at it. So you might as well get started now and memorize this. You're going to have to memorize all of these tanks, all of the rail cars, all of the cargo tanks. You're going to have to memorize this. Let's look on 1130. Again, cone roof tank, an open top floating roof tank. A covered top floating roof tank. Now the difference in those in the open top is you notice how the ladder. The ladder goes up to the side on the open top. The covered actually have at the very top of the tank. They're called eyebrows. That would be a covered top. They're vents, but they're called little eyebrows and they go all the way around the tank. You would need to know if you saw those eyebrows, that is a covered. But if you saw the ladder going up the side of the open floating roof, that that's what that would be. All right, 1132. 1132, low pressure chemical tanks. Low pressure chemical tanks. MC307. MC307. Now, this is all in that handout that I gave you. MC307, low pressure. You must know 
that is between 25 to 35 PSI. And there are two different types. Remember this. Look on page 1133 at the top. 24134, 24135. You see a smooth tank that is an insulated low pressure MC307. Now, what it looks like, if you look at the back, it looks like a horseshoe. And on top of that tank, you see what's called a rollover device. It's a little device at the top, so if the tank does flip over, it won't roll. So if I'm looking at a smooth tank that looks like a horseshoe, it's not oval, it's not rounded on the ends, but it's a horseshoe. That is an insulated, low pressure MC307. Now, what do I need to know about that? I need to know the pressures. I need to know that's an MC307 low pressure. And I also need to know that the emergency shutoffs are located on the left front of the tank, left front of the tank behind the driver. Now, if you look at 24135, you're going to see a non insulated MC307. You're going to see what's either called stiffening rings or ribs around the tank. It's not horseshoe shaped. It has stiffening rings and ribs around the tank. Now, there's going to be another tank that looks identical to this, but there's a little bit of difference. And when we get to it, I'm going to tell you the difference. So a low pressure MC307, non-insulated, has stiffening rings around it. Okay, page 1134. That was low pressure. This is non-pressure. Non-pressure or atmospheric. It might be called atmospheric. MC306. MC306. Looks familiar because this is usually what carries gasoline up and down the roads. Dead giveaway. You look at the back of it and it's oval shaped. Oval shaped. Non-pressure 306. You do need to know the pressures on this. And you also need to know where the emergency shutoffs would be. Usually behind the driver. Left side behind the driver. So, pressure, typical pressures for this that you need to know for PSI. So you need to know that, or you must know that. Now let's look at the corrosive. If you remember earlier, I told you about the non-insulated 307 low pressure with the stiffening rings. Let's look at a corrosive tank. Corrosive tank, MC312. Again, you must know if I flashed a card at you, you would have to look at it and say, that is an MC 312, which is a corrosive tank, you would have to get the pressures and you'd also have to let us know where the emergency shutoff might be. Here's the biggest difference. If you look at uh, figure 24141, that tank also has stiffening rings or ribs around it, but it is a much smaller tank than an MC307 low pressure. They look alike, but here's the difference. The MC307 actually has less rings on it. So count the rings. I think you have that in your handout. Count the rings from the MC307 and count the rings on the MC312. The 312 has more rings on it, stiffening rings, for protection. And it is a way smaller tank because it's carrying corrosives. Small tank, more stiffening rings. The non-insulated 307, larger tank, less stiffening rings. You need to know that. A lot of people get those two mixed up whenever they're doing their uh, testing off on their tanks. Okay, uh, 1137, I already went over the rail cars with you. Uh, one of the things, if you can see the bolted down man cover on top, then you know it's pressurized. If you can see valve fittings, then you would know that it is it is actually uh, non-pressure, bolted down, pressurized, uh, and then if you can see the fittings, that would be non-pressure. Uh, intermodal contains, uh, tanks on 1139, 
Uh, we did say that the IM101 and the IM102 are both non-pressure, and the SPEC51 is a pressurized tank. Okay, let's look at solids holding containers. Many containers, and I'm on page 1139, many containers used to hold liquids may also be used for solids. That could be a drum and a bottle. Need to know that. Some of the containers can either hold liquids or solids, a drum and a bottle. Some transportation containers are especially designed for loading and unloading solids and certain fixed Facilities may store these solids. They're not typically deemed hazardous. All right, we do need to know this, 1140. Small airborne particles that burn, but otherwise may be harmless, can be dangerous if ignited in an enclosed location, causing what is, would be a dust explosion. So what you need to know is that very small dust particles actually can explode if, uh, if all the ingredients, if they are ignited. And that happened in the uh, grain silo many, many years ago over off of the uh, navigation uh, in that area. They did have a dust explosion. Uh, moving through some of the pages here, 1141, uh, dry bulk uh, trailers. These dry bulk uh, trailers are typically not under pressure. They vary in shape, but most of them, just remember this, a dry bulk trailer, dry bulk trailer, they look like a V or a W shaped bottom, a V or a W shaped bottom. And most of the time you would find those carrying fertilizers and those sort of things. So a V, if you see the bottom of it, it looks like a V or a W, then that would be a dry bulk cargo trailer. And some of the dry bulk rail cars uh, could be a covered hopper car, uncovered hopper car, pneumatically unloaded hopper car. And then, of course, bags. Bags are non-bulk. They could be anywhere from explosives, flammable solids, oxidizers, fertilizers, pesticides, any of those things. So bags would be more of the non-bulk type containers. And I think... This leads me to where I left off on the first class. So I'm going to give you some information here. The five or six videos, these first six videos that you've watched, uh, I actually went over these. This, this is where I stopped off and left off with the class that was before you. And then from there, they couldn't come back. So I had to start these video lectures starting on page 1143. Um, it's an old video uh, that I took back in March. Uh, There's some things that I was saying to the class, uh, just to kind of ignore them because there's little, little jokes that we had in the class and stuff like that. And you're probably going to listen to it and say, what the heck is he even talking about? But it's just, I didn't know we were going to have to do this again with your class. And so I don't want to go, I've already went through this once, I don't want to go through it again. So basically, once you get to the end of this video, then you're going to go to the next video, which is shot a little different because I did it with my cell phone. And I, it took forever. I did like an over an hour or so on this thing, finishing this out. So just bear with it. Uh, if there's some little things that I'm talking to them about, about coming back to class and, and little things that maybe we talked about in class and those sort of things, and just little jokes that we had in class, uh, you can ignore it. Uh, I, was, I was actually videoing that for them, and what I did was at the end of the day when we came home is I sat down and I finished this chapter and I posted it for them. So just go to that video and you'll finish out the rest of this chapter. Guys, when we come back, don't worry, I will briefly go back through these chapters. You're going to have to sit here. You're going to have to read. 
That's number one. Do your discussion questions. Do your terms. Memorize this stuff. Go through those handouts that I gave you. Also, there's another video. It's called the ERG, the Emergency Response Guidebook. It's just a quick little description that I went through. Make sure you read, go over that ERG uh, little guidebook, uh, the little video that I did there. I also want to add that in the ERG, there's tables. If you go to the green section, there are different tables. So what might happen is if you go to a certain guide or uh, you have the guide number, you have the name of the chemical, it may say go to table whatever. So if you go to the green pages, the isolation distance, and it says, well, go to table two. So you're on table one, flip over to table two. There's different parts to that. Now you're going to have worksheets that you're going to have to do for the ERG. I'm hoping we're going to come back by July and we can finish this up. But for now, this is what we have. The last class, uh, all but a few, uh, didn't do well on their hazmat at their state test level. Uh, so, but they had the same thing. They just had videos. It's the same thing you have. But the ones that did pass, which was the majority, the majority did pass. And what they did was they sat down and they read and they looked over stuff and they took notes and that's what you're going to have to do. Uh, make sure that whenever you take your exams, be prepared. So anyway, good luck with that. And if there's anything else that I can come up with, I'll definitely throw it out there and I'll post these and I'll send this to you um, with an announcement and I'm going to let you know, uh, keep you updated with what's going on. All right, guys, see you later.